In this short training video, we will cover the basics of lubricants with some examples of applications in which lubricants are found. First, let's start out in a typical blend room to see a lubricant being made. Base oil is usually the largest constituent of a lubricant, typically from around 70 to even over 95% of the blend. Base oils may be derived from many different sources. One example is crude oil from a refinery. Another source is vegetable seeds. Biodegradable lubricants are often made from vegetable oil. Chemical plants also produce base oil. Base oils produced by chemical plants are known as synthetic. Even natural gas can be converted into a base oil. This type of base oil is known as gas to liquid or GTL. The most common is mineral base oil derived from crude oil at the refinery. Depending on the crude oil source and on the refining process, these may be classified in many ways. Viscosity and viscosity index. Classified by the chemistry, whether it's paraffinic, naphthenic, or aromatic. It may be classified by other constituents, such as sulfur or even nitrogen content. Typically, all these methods are used to classify mineral base oil into a group one, group 2 or group 3. In addition, used oil may be collected, sent to a special refinery which re-refines it into fresh base oil, which typically falls into group 1 or group 2 classification. Viscosity is how thick or thin the lubricant is. Ideally, it will be thin enough to circulate to the critical parts but thick enough to provide a strong enough film to protect the rubbing surfaces. Different types of lubricant use different types of classification systems in order to identify their viscosity. This engine oil is classified using the SAE system. The 10W refers to the viscosity of a lubricant at low temperatures, which can be important when the vehicle has to start in cold climates. Typically, to obtain 10W, this engine oil will contain a level of polymer known as viscosity index improver. The 30 refers to the viscosity at higher temperatures, which is important to ensure there's adequate film protection. The higher the viscosity, the stronger and thicker the protective film. This gear oil is also classified using the SAE system. In this case, the 80W indicates higher viscosity at lower temperature. Usually no polymer is needed to reach this viscosity. The 90 refers to quite a viscous or thick lubricant, even at higher temperatures. This is normally required for gears and axle protection. This hydraulic oil is classified by the ISO system. In this case, there's no low temperature designation. Very simply, an ISO 32 is 32 centerstokes at 40 Celsius. Center stokes are the unit of measure for viscosity. These classifications are important because as a lubricant cools down, it becomes much more viscous and may even stop flowing. As a lubricant heats up, it becomes much less viscous and may even stop forming a strong enough film to protect the surfaces. The rate of change in viscosity with temperature, viscosity index or VI, is an important parameter which is controlled by the selection of base oil and by the polymers added to the blend. The formulator controls the lubricant viscosity and how it changes with temperature by careful selection of the constituents of the blend. Some base oils actually contain levels of wax which can cause solid deposits at low temperatures. In fact, wax used to make candles and cosmetics also comes from refineries. This is controlled by careful selection of the base oil and also by adding small amounts of a special polymer called a pourpoint depressant. This pourpoint depressant interacts with the wax and prevents it from crystallizing at too high a temperature. There are many low temperature viscosity tests used to classify lubricants. One of the simplest is called the pourpoint. This measures the lowest temperature the lubricant will still pour. Viscosity index is a measure of the rate of change of viscosity with temperature. It is also influenced by the selection of base oil. Now it can be further influenced by the use of a special type of polymer known as a viscosity index improver 
or VI Improver. VI Improver is a polymer that may often resemble rubber. For convenience, this rubber is usually dissolved in some sort of base oil so that it may be easier to add or mix into the blend. One important thing that the formulator has to take into account is that these VI improvers are on the molecular level extremely long chains of various hydrocarbons. A hydrocarbon is a molecule containing hydrogen and carbon. These chains are so long that in some applications the mechanical action of the moving parts may cause the chains to break up. The polymers then become shorter chains. This impacts the viscosity characteristics of the lubricant. As the polymer chains break up or shear, the viscosity will drop. This phenomena is known as shear stability. There are some standard industry tests used to measure shear stability and it's usually reported as a percentage or centerstoke drop or even as an index. Base oil and the viscosity index improvers, while critical components of a lubricant, can only do so much. Chemical performance additives are also needed. As the temperature rises in the application, the oil may start to oxidize. Many different antioxidants may be used to prevent or inhibit this oxidation. Sludge may build up or even soot from the combustion process. So dispersants are added to control the sludge which has formed and prevent it from plugging filters and to ensure the lubricant keeps on flowing. Many critical parts may become tarnished or varnished. That's where detergents are added to control this type of varnish buildup. Detergents are actually very important additives for the lubricant formulator. As well as controlling varnish buildup, many of them are also effective corrosion inhibitors. Some contain a high level of base, which is very useful when you need to control the acid buildup. Acid buildup is often a result of the combustion process in a crankcase. In addition, detergents, sometimes known as soaps, may be used to formulate greases. As loads increase, many parts start to wear or even break. Many different anti-wear and extreme pressure additives are available to control this. As the conditions become wet, parts may corrode. Many different corrosion inhibitors may be used to prevent rust or even corrosion to brass or bronze, which is a metal often used in many applications. Now there are many other types of additives that may be included in a lubricant. They might be used to impart frictional properties. They might impart tackiness, which is how the lubricant adheres to certain mechanical parts. They may impart water separation or emulsibility characteristics. They may even contain a dye, which allows the user of the lubricant to know which application it should be used in. All these different additives may be added to the blend separately. Usually, however, they're combined into a package. This is far more convenient for the blender, who only has to measure or weigh one package instead of several separate ingredients. It's quite interesting that many of the additives used in lubricants contain metals, such as zinc or calcium. Just like the calcium in milk or iron in blood, these metal ingredients are produced in liquid form so that they're fully dissolved or dispersed in the oil. One final ingredient the lubricant blender must consider is foam inhibitor. Lubricants are often used in applications where there's a high degree of turbulence. Foam may build up in the reservoir and cause many, many problems. If it falls on the floor, it can be a slipping hazard. As it circulates through the system, it may impact the lubricant's ability to protect the components. Air is a very poor lubricant. Engineers, when they design and build the equipment, often design features that recognize the tendency for a lubricant to form foam. There may be baffles in a reservoir, for example, which are designed to reduce the amount of foam. The lubricant blender may also add foam inhibitors to control the foam. Only tiny concentrations are needed. Too much foam inhibitor can cause all sorts of other problems. This demonstration shows what happens in equipment where the lubricant did not have foam inhibitor added. See what happens when the inhibitor is added to the system. 
What we've learned in this video is how a lubricant is made. We've seen it being prepared in a typical blend room. We've seen the function of some of the additives that might be used and the importance of viscosity in controlling the lubricant performance.